Hello my friends. Welcome to my channel, Lindy's Magpie Reads. If you're new here, I'm Lindy. I'm very happy, all of you who have joined me. I pretty much do nothing except read in January. <laughs> so there's always lots of books to talk about. And usually I save the best book for last. But today I am going to start with the one that really knocked my socks off. And that is one I listened to in audio. And Kitty is <laughs> Kitty is needing some attention. I'll try and keep her occupied and talk at the same time. So yes, the audio for no Friend But the Mountains by Behrouz Bouchani, who is a Kurdish-Iranian refugee. He escaped Iran, was seeking asylum in Australia, and was imprisoned by the Australian government. This story, he had to smuggle it out of prison. He was held on Manus Island in Papua New Guinea with many, many, many other refugee claimants. He had a contraband phone and he uh, had to sneak out his in, this entire manuscript in text messages. The translator is Omid Tofigian. He reads some of the audiobook. There's a long translator's note at the beginning and um, more at the end. Uh, Richard Flanagan, the Australian author who won the Booker a while back, he's written the foreword and he also reads it on the audiobook. And then there are another eight different people who read different sections of the audio. It's fantastic audio production. I tried reading this in print last year and I got really bogged down. I think it was just the wrong point in time because I found this story so moving. Uh, Buchani manages to create um, a very literary piece of writing. Well, it's several chapters and they, they evoke the many dehumanizing aspects of being imprisoned indefinitely. He ended up being there for six years and he is now settled in New Zealand. I found that out by watching an interview that was just recorded earlier this week, I think, in Australia. He's got another book out, Freedom, Only Freedom, that I will also read. His work on behalf of wrongly incarcerated people everywhere is so impressive, so admirable, and the conditions in that prison on Manus Island were so bad, so bad. It's very eye-opening. Uh, I highly recommend it. I also recommend that you prepare yourself emotionally. And uh, I think this is something that is going to Go, go, uh, it, it, this is going to be considered a classic for sure. I have more to say about this book and I think I'm going to save it for another video project coming up. So stay tuned for that. If you've read this book, please let me know what your thoughts are in the comments. So next, I am going to tell you about graphic novel slash picture book about war and refugees. À qui appartiennent les nuages 
It's written by a Quebecois author Mario Brassard and illustrated by Gerard Dubois. Dubois grew up in France and now lives in Montreal. This book won the Governor General Award for French Language Children's Literature last year, I think. Recently, anyway. And just this month has been published in English, Who Owns the Clouds? It was translated by Yvette Guillaume. The war is not named in here. So this woman is telling the story from the viewpoint of herself as an adult. She's 34 and she's looking back on herself uh, as a nine-year-old. She and her family had to leave. It's almost a dreamlike. There is, uh, she keeps trying to stay awake because every time she goes to sleep, when she wakes up, more of her village has been destroyed. comfort in the softness of the cats that are wandering around the village. I especially love this image. She eventually does fall asleep. She talks about how she always has the same dream of a line of people. Eventually she joins, she and her family join that line of people. The use of color is absolutely amazing. Red nose there. It's almost like a black and white film. As an adult, the trauma stays with her. Her child self is still with her. This is such a moving book. This book was uh, part of the Bataille des Bouquins, which is organized by the Edmonton Public Library for francophone students in grades four, five, and six. And I would say this book is suitable for age nine and up. Now, interestingly, the English language edition, the publisher, Tundra, has recommended for age 12 and up. And that is something that I've noticed that, um, that Quebecois and non-English European um, books tend to have more tough topics for a younger age. Yeah, anyway, the artist with his gorgeous vintage illustrations, I realized I had talked about one of his picture books in October last year. I will link that video below. I compared both the English and the French editions of On the Other Side of the Forest. And I am definitely going to pick up more by Dubois. Next up I have a collection of poetry by Michael Rosen called On the Move. Home is where you find it. And this is about human migration. He says, it's the story of the human race. He starts out by relating it to his own Jewish family. They were originally from Poland and his parents moved to uh, the UK. 
Two of his uncles died in the Second World War. One of them fought on the side of the German army in World War I, and then in World War II was sent to Auschwitz where he died. Another uncle fought on the side of the French during the First World War, and the French later sent him to Auschwitz where he died. Uh, in the later part of the book, he moves into more general poems about displaced people, um, migrants, and refugees. And there are some fabulous illustrations by Quentin Blake in here that really capture the mood. In the poems at the end, he does address some intolerance of immigrants, which he has probably experienced in England. And so I'm going to read the poem, English Literature. I studied English literature. We start at the beginning, they said, with Beowulf, written a thousand years ago. In Old English, they said, so you had better learn Old English. Beowulf was so old that the Old English it was written in was like Old Dutch or Old German. Look in the back of the book for notes, they said. It turns out that no one in Beowulf was English. Later, we read Chaucer. This is when modern English literature begins, they said. Read the notes at the back. It'll help you, they said. Turns out that some of the stories came from Italy, some came from France, and the whole idea of the book being people telling stories came from Arabic books. Later, we read Shakespeare. This is the greatest writer of English literature, they said. Look at the notes at the back, they said. Turns out that some of the stories came from Italy, from ancient Greece and ancient Rome and from Scandinavia, with bits from the Bible throughout. And the Bible was originally from the Middle East. Later, we read books by Emily, Anne, and Charlotte Bronte. They were born in England. Their father came from Ireland. Later, we read Oscar Wilde, who came from Ireland, Bernard Shaw, who came from Ireland, and Joseph Conrad, who came from Poland. Then it stopped. We weren't allowed to go on after 1900. Otherwise, I might have studied T.S. Eliot, American, James Joyce, Irish, Chinua Achebe, Nigerian, Jean Reis, Dominican, or Derek Walcott, who came from St. Lucia. So there you have it, English literature. From On the Move, let's go to On the Go, and Hair. These two board books are published by Little Feminist a children's book club subscription and publishing house. They say their team curates the best diverse books, creates accompanying dis discussion questions and activities, and delivers to families around the world. We publish books to fill the gaps we find in children's literature. In the note for grown-ups, make space for kiddos to notice and ask about disabilities. Avoiding conversations about ability and mobility allow disability stereotypes to persist. And then there's questions for babies and toddlers, like, can you find all the different wheels in the book? And for slightly older children, talk about what a prosthetic is and um, look for those in the book. In the one on hair, I really liked that in one of the photos, we see a little girl from behind and she has hair on her back and all of these families just look so happy it's very very appealing so if you're looking for gifts for little ones i recommend these now we're moving on to more of the tough stuff i picked up a novel in verse african town written by Irene Latham and 
Charles Waters. Latham is white and Waters is black. They're both Americans. This is inspired by the true story of the last American slave ship. These poems alternate uh, from 14 different voices. There is a different poetry style for each of the characters as well, and this is explained at the end. The end notes at the back are extensive and very helpful. As I was reading this story, I thought this sounds vaguely familiar. Well, it turns out that Kosolo, who's one of the main characters, he's the storyteller here, is the same person that Zora Neale Hurston interviewed and wrote about in Barracoon, the story of the last black cargo, which I read a few years ago. Anyway, the timeline at the back is helpful. We learn that in 1808, America bans the importation of enslaved people from Africa. And then in 1860, uh, a white plantation owner, Timothy Meher, got a sea captain, um, William Foster, to take his ship to the kingdom of Dahomey and purchase 110 African prisoners and smuggle them back to the U.S. In 1861, the Civil War started. In 1865, the war ends. In 1868, there was a 14th Amendment and American-born African uh, enslaved people were granted citizenship. And then later on that year, the people that came across on that last slave ship, the Clotilda, uh, they weren't, they hadn't been born in the U.S., but they also were granted citizenship. And eventually per they purchased land and started a town, African town, which is now called Africa Town, and it still exists. One of the things that struck me in these poems is that uh, Abile, who's one of the women who were kidnapped is afraid that the white people are going to eat them. And they meet James, who is an Alabama-born enslaved man, and he's been told that in Africa people are cannibals. So he's a little wary about these new slaves on the plantation. Well, that first book that I told you about, No Friend But the Mountains, the refugees, when they were being sent to Manus Island prison, they were told that the native people there, the Pap Papua New Guineans, were cannibals. And the Papua people were told that these men that are in this prison are murderers and very dangerous people. That suspicion of strangers is reinforced by untrue stories like this. And also, one of the things that Beirus Buchani talks about in no, no Friend But the Mountains is that they were not allowed to play cards or play games of any kind. Somebody got a hold of a black marker and drew a backgammon game on a white tabletop and they used the tops from their water bottles as game pieces but the Australian guards came in and broke that up and um, blacked over the game so that it wasn't visible anymore not allowed to play any games. In African Town this is a piece of Kosala's voice before they've left Africa. After a while, soldiers move us inside to the barracoon. At least there's a roof. Voices become less desperate, friendlier. 
We even play games in De Barakun. Grown men acting like boys, jumping up to spy things outside the high windows. It's true, the ocean doesn't stop being the ocean, and even locked up, we don't stop being people. Way towards the end of the book, when once the, the group of people that had all been on that ship were freed at the end of the Civil War, I really liked um, seeing that portion of the story, including the first time that uh, some of the men were able to vote. <sighs> yeah, the thing that I like the least about this book is that one of the voices is the voice of the ship, Clotilda, and I thought that that stretched things a bit too much. Her poems are in couplets, and the authors say that's to be kind of like waves. Her voice, with each surge across the waves, I fight to keep us all safe and strong. If I'd been built with a heart, it would be broken. Yeah, it's a bit over the top for me. Other than that, I think this is an important addition to literature about Africans in the United States and especially because it's suitable for younger readers probably age 12 and up and it's yet yeah, very approachable. The last book I'm going to tell you about is also by two authors. Does My Body Offend You? is written by Mira Cuevas and Marie Marquardt. And the chapters alternate between two voices. I'm not sure if the authors themselves alternated and one wrote one chapter and one the other, but it seems that way. Uh, Cuevas grew up in Puerto Rico and it set right after Hurricane Maria and Malena and her mother have moved to Florida while her father is still in Puerto Rico and helping with the damage after the hurricane. And uh, the other voice is Ruby, who is white. So the two of them end up working together to change their school's unfair dress code. This is a story that is chock full of the feminism and sexism and white saviorism and white privilege and male privilege, intersectionality, family dynamics, and friendship with two really engaging characters. I just flew through this book. It's over 400 pages and it reads really quickly. It's say suitable for probably age 13 and up. I don't know what else to say except if what I've said so far sounds good, I think you'll enjoy this. And that's all I've got for you today. That's plenty. Thank you so much for watching. I look forward to your comments down below. Let me know if you've read any of these, if you have suggestions for things along these lines. I always welcome your comments and interacting with you. Bye for now.